This distraction dilemma is one that is in every single one of our lives to either a small degree or a great degree. The devil puts many distractions out there and that creates a dilemma for us Christians, right? Well, the main thing that the devil wants to do is to break our connection with God. That's really all he wants to do and he doesn't care what distraction we get wrapped up in. And this, like I said, this last sermon we're going to go over is called the four C's of Christianity. And I hope that as we go through this in Revelation 12, 11, that you'll see something here that maybe you've never seen before. Now that's a pretty bold goal in an educated congregation. But when I was studying the scripture and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony and they loved not their lives, under the death. When I was studying this scripture, God spoke to my heart one day and showed me something that helped me to just distill it down. And it was very exciting and very profound to me. And I want to share that with you. The four C's of Christianity. The first C, if you're taking notes, is connect. So the first in a succession of four, the first C is connect. And if we are not vitally connected to Christ, then the whole Christian experience comes tumbling down. Is that true? Absolutely. When we are connected, then the entire Christian experience can be built. Let's read in John 15, 4 to 8. Abide in me and I in you. In other words, connect. What does it mean to abide? It, it, abide. it definitely means to connect. It means to obey. It means to follow, to keep to, to hold to, stick to, stand by, act in accordance with, continue, persist. Right? Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it connect or stick to the vine. No more can ye, except you, act in accordance with me, or abide in me. I am the vine... You are the branches. He that abideth in me, he that persists in me, he that continues in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, without a connection to me, you can do what? How much? Nothing. You can do nothing. So the connection is vital for the Christian. And the devil wants to hinder or tarnish our connection. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. So if we're not connected to Christ, if we're not abiding in him, consisting in him, then we have a whole different future. And it's not one of eternal love and joy and peace. It's of eternal loss. If you abide in me, if you follow me, if you keep to me, if you stick to me, and my words abide in you, persist in you, and if they, if they stick to your ribs, if you will, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Wow. But many times we go and we pray and we say, oh, Lord, I need this or I need that or, oh, this is happening and, oh, this is happening. And we're, we're going back and forth saying, oh, I need the Lord. No, I can take control. I need the Lord. No, I can take control. Yet we don't want to connect with him and we're wondering why it seems like sometimes our prayers aren't being answered because many times he speaks to us through his word, but we're not spending time in his word. Hello? Because a reciprocal relationship is what the Lord needs, just like between a husband and a wife. There needs to be what kind of communication? One way or two way? Two way communication. And so when we have two way communication with God, we pray to Him. That's us speaking to Him. He either impresses our mind or He reveals His will and His word. That's Him speaking to us. So if we neglect the answers that we're praying for, no wonder we're not hearing the answers sometimes. Does that make sense? Verse 8, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. So God wants us to be amazing fruit bearers. And we shall know them by their fruit. And so you shall be my disciples. So the only way to bear much fruit is to be connected to 
Jesus, the vine. The only way to overcome, ultimately, is found in James 4, 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So, how do we submit ourselves, therefore, to God? What does that mean to submit ourselves, therefore, to God? Obey? Sure. When you submit to something, you're obeying. Are you above or below that? You're below it. So when I submit to God, I know my rightful place. I'm not the creator. I am the creation. And I'm not going to put my ideas above the creator's ideas. Amen? And so I know my place, and I'm going to say, not my will, but yours be done. You see, when I do this whole philosophical thing of do what thou wilt, when I engage in that kind of lifestyle, what I'm saying is, I know better than God. I'm higher than God. No, it says to submit yourselves, therefore, to God. So when we come to God, we submit, we're saying, I don't have the answers. I'm not above you. You're above me. I submit to you, and I'm asking you to change my heart. I'm asking you to work through me. Because the next part of the phrase says, resist the devil. Because if I'm not submitted to God, and he's not living out his will throughout me, I'm never going to be able to resist the devil. How many times have you tried to resist the devil, and you have failed? We can't even count them all, right? But how many times have you resisted and have success? Hopefully you can't count them all. Amen? What's the difference? One, we were connected and Christ was able to work through us. And he had the victory through us. Now we had to be a willing participant. It's an action word, resist the devil. And then, of course, it says, the devil will flee from you. You see, it's actually an equation. This plus this equals this. Submission plus resistance with his strength and power equals victory. The devil fleeing. That's powerful to me. Now, Psalm 50 verse 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble, and I will deliver you, and thou shalt glorify me. So God is saying, if you're having issues in your life, if you're having problems in your life, if you but submit to me and you call upon me, I'm there for you, and you're going to glorify me because you're going to have the victory. Because God has an expected end for us, and that is a victorious one. Do you believe that, church? Amen. Now, I, I enjoy a healthy relationship with my mother. Praise God. It was rough and tough when I was a kid, but God has really healed us and brought things together for us. And sometimes I, I call my mother, and sometimes she has the audacity not to answer the phone. I get, hello, this is Pam. I'm sorry, I'm not here right now. I'm like, that's not Pam. That's not true. It's a poor copy of Pam, right? I'm not available right now. Leave me a message and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. But mom, I needed some counsel. Mother, I needed to talk to you about something and she had the audacity to have a life outside of mine. But here's what's so amazing to me about God. Every time I've called upon God, I have never gotten an answering machine. Amen? Never once. There's always been God on the other end. There's always, well, he's right here, but it, you get the idea. He's always been there for me. He's always had the answers that I needed, but I needed to call upon him in the day of trouble. You see, what the devil says is, no, 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 don't, I know things are tough. Don't worry about it. Just escape to all of my stuff. Escape to my movies and my music because, you know, that's what's going to help you. No, that's not the reality. If I come to God first, If I what? If I call upon him when I'm in trouble, he will. It doesn't say he'll think about it. He'll get back to me. It says, I will deliver you, and you're going to glorify me. What's the first C? Connect. Amen. Messages to young people, 431. 
Communion with God encourages good thoughts. Could we also say connection with God? Sure. Encourages good thoughts, noble aspirations, clear perceptions of truth, and lofty purposes of action. Those who thus connect their souls with God are acknowledged by Him as His sons and daughters. They are constantly reaching higher and still higher, obtaining clearer views of God and of eternity until the Lord makes them channels of light and wisdom to the world. You see, connection with God must happen before we can even move on to the second sea with any sort of power. There was a time when I didn't know my wife, Kobe, and that was a dark time of my life. There was a time that I did not know her, and eventually I saw her, and I wanted to connect with her. And so I went up to her, and I said, Hi, my name is Christian. Will you marry me? Is that what you think what happened? No. If, if that's what I had said, what should she do? She should like, you know, or whatever. She's like, what are you, who are you, buddy? I don't even know you. Why would she not want to be with me? Because she hadn't ever connected with me. Right? And so sometimes we are trying to get people to a different level of Christianity and expect them to make the second C, which is commitment. We try to get them to a commitment level before we've allowed them to engage in the connection level, if you will. And by the way, connection never, never stops. I'm still connecting with my wife 15 years later. Well, 16 and a half now, but I've been married 15 and so, many times we try to get to a commitment level with the Lord, and, and of course it does say in Psalm 37, 5, commit thy way unto the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. And what does it mean to commit? It means to pledge, to set aside, right? So, for instance, if I, if I commit or pledge some money, I'm setting it aside. Is that right? Sure. So what happens is, we're trying sometimes to get people to make a commitment to God, sometimes within a short 28-day spirit of prophecy, excuse me, a prophecy seminar, and we want them to get, to get them to a place of commitment and expect them to have connected and made a decision, and yes, I'm going to go through and, and, and have a life with Jesus now. And friends, sometimes that format just doesn't work. I'm not faulting it, but there are some things we got to be careful with. That's why I'm thankful for pastors and elders and the laity that will actually be at the seminars and support the seminars and make friends with those who are attending because we need to engage in that friendship evangelism to where we can start loving them into the truth and they go, yeah, now I'm seeing, I see God's people here and I want to be part of this. And so what we need to do is help them in that connection phase with our children. We need to help them learn how to connect to Jesus because we can't just say, you need to be obeying, you need to be, we can do that for a little while when they're, they're little, but when their reasoning powers start to come into play, we have to help them learn how to connect with Jesus so they themselves make the commitment to Jesus. Amen? Otherwise, it's just my parents' religion. Commit thy way into the Lord. The government of God is not, as Satan would make it appear, founded upon a blind submission and unreasoning control. It appeals to the intellect and the conscience. Come now, let us reason together, is the Creator's invitation to the beings that He has made. Isaiah 1.18 It remains for us to choose whether we will be set free from the bondage of sin to share the glorious liberty of the sons of God. So, when I first met Kobe, I would not expect her to blindly marry me. Why? Because we hadn't spent that time together. We hadn't seen and tested the waters. Can I trust my heart with her? Do I, do I think that, that she's going to take my heart out of my chest and throw it on the ground and stomp on it? Or do I, do I believe that she'll be careful with my heart? Do I believe that she will help me in my journey of life. Now, when I first met her, I wasn't a Christian. Do we have the similar likes? Do we have similar dislikes? Do we like the same kind of music? Do we like the same kind of movies? And all that kind of stuff. Back in the day, those are the questions that I would ask myself. And once we connected enough 
and I believed that she wouldn't rip my heart out of my chest, if you will, because the connection phase was happening, two-way communication was happening, then I carefully went to the next stage and I said, and this is kind of pathetic, but this is really how it happened, I didn't say, will you marry me? I didn't say that. Will you be my girlfriend? I didn't say that. Will you be my fiance? I didn't say that. I said, look, I really like you. I think I'm in deep like with you. And I'm serious. Am I telling you the truth, honey? Yes, I am. And I said to her, I really like you. She's easy to like. And so I was like, I really like you. And I'm getting the hunch here that you really like me, but I don't want to be boyfriend and girlfriend, but let's just not see other people. I mean, that's actually what I said. And she said, okay, that sounds good to me. I'm like, wow, we really are equally yoked. <laughs> so what was I afraid of? I was afraid of rejection. I was afraid of, afraid of commitment. But see, friends, what God has said is, look, I'm giving you an invitation to come and reason with me. I'm giving you an invitation to come and taste and see that I am good. Taste and see that you can, you can trust me with your heart because I'm never going to rip it out of your chest and throw it down on the ground. You can trust me. The only way we come to that conclusion is if we have spent time with him in prayer and in his word. That's how we connect. Without a connection, we will never, ever get to the place of wanting to make that commitment. Why? For fear of rejection. What if God rejects me? But when we learn of God's character, he doesn't reject us. So then that can build some confidence and say, I want to commit to God. Uh, and we almost think, oh, I hope he doesn't let me down. Is God going to let us down? No, the reality we say is, I hope I don't let him down. That's really what we're saying. And sometimes we're going to let him down. But you know what? As a loving spouse, and that's what he is, the husbandman, he'll take his bride back. Eventually, we moved to that commitment phase because I learned that I could trust Kobe, and she learned that she could trust me, that she wouldn't betray me. Having faith and confidence and trust in God, we have everything, and God will never betray our confidence. You can trust Him. He is ever-loving and patiently bears with our weaknesses and our infirmities and is ever willing to forgive our perversities. Did you just read that? He's not throwing us away because we have problems. He's not. He's saying, it says here, he patiently bears with our weaknesses, infirmities, and he's willing to forgive our perversities. He's there for us, friends. You can trust him all the way into heaven. And it says here, to walk then meekly, trustingly and humbly before him. Commit your way to him. Cast all your care upon him, for he careth. Amen. It's a different picture of God, isn't it? Some people have this picture of God, obey me or I'm going to burn you. That's not. That's a false doctrine. Well, Kobe and I spent time together and we eventually fell in love with each other. I fell in love with her. In fact, I said, you know what? I am now in love with you. I said those words, terrifying to me, but I said those words. I have to understand, I had multiple relationships before this, and my heart had been ripped out of my chest and thrown on the ground. But now I got to this place where I'm like, I believe I can trust her. And so I got to the place where I said, you know what? I love you so much, I'm willing to forsake all others 90% of the time. What are you laughing about? I mean, come on, that's an A. Right, teachers? I mean, that's an A. It's a low A, but it's an A. Do you think she should take the deal? No. Ooh, you guys are tough. How about this? I said, Kobe, I love you so much. I'm going to give you 95% of myself. Now, that's a solid A. Should she take the deal? Why? It's not 100. Ooh, you want 100%? 
Is that even possible for the human being to be faithful 100%? Yes, it is. And she should take nothing less than all of my heart. Amen? In fact, even heathens without God's help can be faithful. But imagine the Christian that's truly connected. There's not even a problem with being faithful. Right? 100% is what she deserves. Amen? Amen. You know what's amazing to me? Is that God knows all our junk. He knows who we are. Not the facade we might put on. He knows the struggles we have that maybe even our spouse doesn't even know about. He knows what's really going on in our hearts. He knows how sometimes we're even questioning, is all this even real? He knows sometimes that we're backsliding. Sometimes we might be backslidden right now. He knows all the skeletons in our closet. In fact, I want to say, if Kobe probably knew just how emotionally messed up I was, I don't know that she would have taken the deal because I was a pretty damaged guy with my abusive childhood and all the junk and the mental stuff that had happened during my childhood. I didn't know how to love. I was totally messed up. And if, I think if she could really read and see my heart, she would have been like, um, no, thank you. But you know what? God can really see and he knows our hearts. And here's the most beautiful thing news today. He has still chosen you. He still chose me. And guess what? I don't even give him 100%. Should he take the deal? In logical terms, no. Because sometimes I go, as the Bible says, a whoring after other lovers. But you know what? God will take the deal even if we give him just 1%. He says, I can work with that. And God's a miracle worker because at one point in my life, I gave him maybe 1%. I would have never thought of being preaching on the stage in a church around the world, but God's really good at working with 1%. But he didn't leave me at 1%. Amen? I don't know what percent I am now, but I know it ain't 1%. Amen? I know it's not 100%, otherwise I'd be translated, I think. So here's the reality. You're all here too, and so am I. So what that means is that we're not perfect yet, but we're in a process of being made whole. And when I finally realized that, that she was going to take me and I was going to take her, then I finally said, you know what? I'm okay with this commitment, and I want to go forward with you. And then when I learned about God, and I, I saw that He was going to be careful with my heart, and He was going to help me, and He was going to love me, and He was going to train me, and teach me, and He was going to knock off some hard edges, and He was going to do all the things He needed to do, I realized He was doing it because He truly loved me. You are a chosen generation. You're chosen by God himself. You are a royal priesthood. We come from a royal family, friends. We are a holy nation, a peculiar people. That means a set-aside people. That you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. We love him because he first loved us. And so I hope that our love for God is actually reflected in our lives. I hope we're not paying lip service to him saying, oh, I love God, and we go out with our life and we deny God. I could say to Kobe, I love you. I love you so much. I'm sorry that I went out and I was with some other woman. I'm so sorry. And then I, and I never do it again. Could she forgive me? Yeah, and could we move on and have a, a healthy relationship? We could. That's true. It's happened. Not, I mean, no, not with us. I'm sorry. It's happened around this world. Praise God. Right, honey? It has not happened. <laughs> but the reality is there is forgiveness for sin. 
And even if we go off a whoring as seven books in the Bible describe after our idols or after other lovers and we go off after these things and we come back to God, God doesn't go, are you sure you want to come back this time? He says, no, I will sing over you. I love you and the lost has been found. God still chooses you. He still chooses me. And once we got together, we started finding out about each other, just like most people do. I began calling Kobe my girlfriend, and she became my people, if you will. We committed to each other. They shall call upon my name, and I will hear them, and I will say, it's my people. And they shall say, the Lord is is my God. You see, she became mine, and I became hers, and I was set aside. I became a peculiar man, a set-aside man for her and her alone. In other words, I'm going to deny every other woman on the face of this planet and frankly, that's what God wants of each one of us, that we will deny every other lover for Him. Well, I got to choose Kobe freely. She didn't force me to choose her. I didn't force her to choose me. We chose freely, and this is what God wants as well, that we choose freely to love and worship Him. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So today is the day to choose, right? Because tomorrow might be too late for a couple of reasons. We could leave this place and our, we might lose our life. And what if I was just going to put off making the decision, to, a, a commitment to God? And I lost my life and I never, I, never, I never did. Or what if today you're strong in the Lord, but tomorrow you go back to that weak vessel, and you don't make the decision. Today is the day of salvation. And the devil's trying to do everything he can to distract us from making that decision daily in our lives as Christians. He tells us to come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, separate from all other lovers, separate from all other idols, come away from all other gods, if you will. He says, come on, come out. The spirit of prophecy says, let us think of the goodness of God. Let us tell of his power. Let us sing of his love. Let us commit our souls unto God as unto a faithful creator and stop worrying and fretting. God will help us to live above the things of this life and will give us abundance of good things to think about and to talk about. Let us come into the presence of Christ. He is cleansing the heavenly sanctuary. Let us enter there by faith. Provision has been made for our cleansing. A fountain has been opened for sin and uncleanness. Ask in faith for the grace of God, and you will not ask in vain. Here's what I want to say, friends. You can trust God with all of your heart. I challenge you to connect with Him like you've never connected before. And when you see just how beautiful and awesome God is, then don't hesitate to make a commitment to Him. Seize the moment. What prevents you from being baptized right now? What stumbling blocks are in our way? What distractions do we have in our life that we think we can't live without? What things are pulling us away from God? And friends, it doesn't just have to be entertainment, movies or music or books, internet. It can be job It can be success, it can be fame, it can be money, it could even be 
ministry. I've been caught in the trap a number of times to where I've been so busy working for the Lord that I forget the Lord of the work. It's true. And those of us who've been in ministry, you know exactly what I'm talking about. The first C is connect. And how do we connect? Say again. I can't hear you. Knowing more of God. We connect with God. We get into our Bibles. We pray. We spend time with the Lord. That's connection, right? And then once we see what God has for us and, the, and that, that we need Him in our life and that He has nothing but good to offer us and to help us, then we can move to a, comment, a commitment stage. And once we step forward in that commitment, we are now commencing. That's the third C. We're now commencing our life with God. And so it was with Kobe. When I first met her, we had to spend time together to get to know each other. And then when I saw I could trust her and she could trust me, then I committed my life to her and she committed to me. And then finally I said the words, Will you what? Marry me. And I got on my knees and I had a bouquet of flowers. It was cheesy, I suppose, but that's how I did it. Amen. She said it was perfect. Praise the Lord. There's a big story there, by the way. Someday we might release our story. It's it's amazing. And so I asked her to marry me, and my heart's going, right? And then she says yes, and it's like, oh, I heard the angels. And the Lord gaveth me a good thing when he gave me Kobe. And so I, I stepped forward. I commenced my relationship with, with Kobe. You know what's sad to me is so many people get stuck in the connection phase and they never make the commitment phase and then they never can commence their life together and have a glorious marriage. And I see that in Christianity too where many times they stay in this connection phase or a quasi-connection phase. Well, we're going to check that out. We'll check this out. We'll check that. We're never going to God and learning of Him directly. We're listening to this person. We're listening to that person. Here a little, there a little. We're, we're watching this program, watching that. And we just fill our head with all this stuff, yet we don't personally connect to God. So we never get to a place of commitment, and we never commence the work of God. What a sad thing. Because truly, connection is vital. And commitment is vital. But friends, until you put some feet on your Christianity, until you start doing something awesome to bring souls to Jesus Christ and commence the work of God, you're missing out on a very huge chunk of your Christian experience. It's true. Matthew 28, 19 talks about commencement. Go! That's the first word. What does that mean? Go, it means commence, amen? Go, on your mark, get set, stop. But that's what a lot of Christians do. They get their eyes on the mark, Jesus Christ. They get set, they want to make that commitment, but they never go. Do you know how many people I talk to? That sometimes I'll actually go to churches or organizations or different camps and then they'll invite me back later maybe a couple three years later four years later sometimes and say would you come back we say sure and we come back and sometimes the same exact people that told me of their plans for ministry for God four years prior are still planning to do something for God in the future and I'll say hey brother How's it going? You talked to me last time about starting a little vegan vegetarian restaurant uh, so you can help spread the the truth about the health message. How's that going for you? Well, you know, uh, we're still thinking about that. I said, and and some of these I've established good friendships with, and I say, so are you going to think about that all the way into the pearly gates? What's, What's lacking there? Either the connection or the commitment. And if we have a proper connection, we'll have the commitment. Because it's a natural progression. When you see God for who He really is, you will want to commit your life to Him. 
and then you'll want to go out and tell somebody about it, commence the work of God. But if you don't want to work for God and do something personally for God, something's wrong with the connection or the commitment. Make sense? But I don't know what to say. I don't know how to speak, Christian. Well, I don't know how to speak either. In fact, Moses said, um, now therefore, uh, Moses said, I, 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 I can't speak because I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't know. No, no. no, he either had a stuttering problem or he didn't know the language. I think it was, frankly, it was both. He was slow of speech and he didn't know the language. That's kind of a problem for communicating. Don't you think? At least in our human reasoning. And, but the commission is, now therefore go. It says, go and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So did Moses want to go? He did, but he was afraid because his flesh was weak. And then God says to Moses, no, now therefore go. And I will be with thy mouth and I will teach thee what to say. But I'm afraid, Christian, I don't know how to do Bible studies. I don't know how to speak. I don't know how to do, okay, fair enough. But God did say, now therefore go and I'll be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Did he not say that? Of course he did. So what that means is, when God is bidding us to do something, he's going to enable us to do it. That's the truth. But I don't know how. Give it to God. When I first, when I was young in my faith, one of my first Bible studies was with about eight young men a friend of mine who had been raised Adventist came to me and said, hey, Christian, there's this group of young guys that want to get together and study the Bible. Will you, I've never done a Bible study. Would you come and do that? I'm like, well, I haven't done a Bible study yet either. He's like, okay, are you willing? I'm like, well, yeah, because I was connected and I was committed and I wanted to commence the work of God, amen? Now, I had already been working for multiple different ministries. I was in full-time ministry um, in, in that capacity, working as a worker for God. But I hadn't done Bible studies myself outside of talking with Kobe and helping her to come to the Lord. But I wanted to, be, I wanted to commence the work of God. So I said, sure, let's go, let's do it trembling as my knees smote one to the other, okay? So I go because I knew the scripture. Now, therefore, go, I'll be with thy mouth and teach thee what thou shalt say. Now, I had been putting it in, and I believed that he would help me take it back out. Amen? So we went, and this Bible study went on for many, 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 many months. And friends, I was not good at it. <laughs> I'm telling you right now. But I told him this. I said, look, you know, I'm a new Christian here, and I'm willing to study the Word of God with you guys, and eventually it came out to be me being the leader of the study group, and so what, what do you think that did to me throughout the week leading up to the next Bible study? <laughs> oh, he, uh, amen, C call upon me, de -de -de -de, 911 to heaven, and in the Word of God, right? Interesting how that works. When we're connected, committed, and we're commencing, you better know what you're talking about, and so I started going forward, and I would say to them, look, I don't know all the answers, but I know the, all the answers are in this word. So if I can't tell you this answer right this moment, give me a week, and next week I'll have the answer for you. Fair enough? They said, okay, great. So then that would give me time to go in there, ask other people who were longer in the faith and knew the answer, or I could go and find it myself. Well, eventually it went all the way down to one guy, apparently I wasn't doing very well, apparently, to my eyes. Seven drop out, and one guy is left. Even the guy that invited me to do it left. I'm serious. I'm going, Lord, you called the wrong guy. I'm the video dude. I'm the director. I'm not a, a public speaker. I'm not a Bible study guy. I, you calling the wrong guy. And the Lord says, shh, now therefore go. I'll be with thy mouth and teach you what thou shalt say. Eventually that last guy said, could my wife join us for study? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. That means he's still interested. And guess what God did? He brought a Mormon family out of Mormonism into the Seventh-day Adventist church, and to this day they are faithful members and a deacon and deaconess in the Adventist church. Is it because I did it good? Nope, but it's because I was willing, I was connected, committed, and I was willing to commence. Amen?
So there's no excuse for you. Amen? Pastor's wife says, Amen. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. But I'm afraid. What if I disappoint you, Lord? What if I fail? I, I don't, I, what if I don't do it right and I drive people away? Don't worry about it. I'll be your shield and I'm going to give you positive results because God knows who he wants talking to who. He knows that because he's the master chess player and he's moving all the pieces and he brings this one over here a little bit with this one and that one before you know it they come and they join the faith god says i know the thoughts that i think toward you thoughts of peace not of evil to give you an expected end i will help you through your walk with me, and when you commence, I'm going to give you an expected end, you will be successful. Now, seemingly, it was a loss because we lost seven of them. No. In God's eyes, it was a colossal victory because we gained two souls for the kingdom. Amen? For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints, and you do minister. So it is about going out and sharing our faith. But friends, if I don't have a faith in God, what am I going to share? Do you see why connection is vital? The connection must come first, then the commitment built on the connection and then the commencing of the work of God that's built on your commitment and the connection. Make sense? So it, do you see why now the devil just wants to affect and, and inhibit the connection? Right? So if he can distract us and mess with the connection, then he knows our Christian experience comes tumbling down. Well, Kobe and I decided to step out by faith and commence our lives together, and we got married. We went to the altar and gave our lives to each other unreservedly. We commenced our lives together. We got married, and I said, I do. And she said, I do. Now, in those words, I do, what does that mean? I do promise to give you my heart, and my heart only for you. I do promise to protect your heart. I do promise, and all the things that go with it, and all the beautiful things, and just two words, I do. And God has already said to us, I do. He's waiting for us to say to him, I do. Why would we not? Because we haven't learned about him yet. Before our marriage, we both gave our lives, not only to each other, but most importantly, over to God. And we commenced our relationship together now with Him. We both said, I do, to Christ. As an ambassador of Christ, I implore you to commence your work. Review and Herald, December 16th, 1884. To commence your work intelligently. Pick up the raveling ends and bind them off for time and eternity. It is not too late yet for wrongs to be righted. And while Jesus, our mediator, is pleading in our behalf, let us do our part of the work. Love God with all thy heart and thy neighbor as thyself. With Kobe, I could have said, what if I say the wrong things? What if I don't do all the right things? And what if she says no to me? And what if I disappoint her? And what if, and what if, and what if, and what if? And if I had never taken that step to go, okay, I'm going to step out there on a limb and see if she wants to be with me, I could have lost out on 16 years of the best relationship I've ever had in my life. And friends, what if God, what if I fail God? What if God doesn't accept me? What if, what if, what if, what if? And we just don't step out by faith faith and we miss out on the beautiful blessing of a relationship with God I mean I made that commitment to God 16 years ago myself I'm going to tell you it's been the best decision of my life with God 
we went forward, and we've been greatly rewarded with a beautiful marriage. Amen? Christ, in the word, is called the husbandman, and we are the church. We are called the bride. And this is symbolic of the close connection that we can have with each other and with Christ. We can become one with Christ. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. So you see, this is how it works. It says that if we connect with Him and we commit our lives to Him, then it is Christ's strength that will help me do all things. It's not my own strength. Of course, I need to have my willing participation in this relationship, just like I need to be willingly participating with Kobe. And so when I participate willingly, and God says, Christian, I want you to go here or do this, I say, sure, Lord, here am I, send me. My wife says, Kobe, uh, Christian, will you do this or will you do that? I say, sure, sweetheart, what do you need? Not, what? What do you want me to do that for? You do it yourself. Oh, that's great relationship, right? We've never had that. If she asks me something, it's, of course, I want to serve her. Why? Because I esteem her better than myself. I love her. Same with God. If God asks me to go and do something, and come up with all these excuses, is that really reflecting a love for God? Or is it lip service? Is it fear from the devil? Is it a lack of connection or commitment? Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers in the music industry, against the rulers of darkness in the movie industry and of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done a little bit to stand. All to stand. When we are connected When we are committed, when we are commencing, ultimately we will experience the fourth C, and that is we will conquer. Amen? Wait upon the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen thy heart. Wait, I say, upon the Lord. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. If you're connected, if you're committed, if you're commencing, you're going to conquer and we're going home. Amen. But friends, if we don't connect and we let the devil tarnish that connection or just slowly sever it, or even just take it out with one fell swoop, we will not see the kingdom. Connection. It's all about connecting with our maker. Do you see it? Praise God. So how do we in a tangible way, how do we in a in a practical way get rid of the distractions of this life? That's a huge question, isn't it? It's a tall order. How do we get rid of this stuff? Let me me propose to you a 90-day challenge. A 90-day challenge where it starts with no media for 45 days. Is that possible for the human being to do? Some would believe it's not. A complete media blitz for 45 days. Here's how it works. That means no TV. That means no movies. That means no music. That means no gaming. That means no secular magazine. No no books that are outside of a spiritual content. That means no internet. That means no Facebook. That means no Netflix. That means no media. That's how you overcome. That's just too fanatical. No, it's not. Let me ask you this question. Let me try to put it in perspective for you. Should a person who wants to overcome, 
alcoholism, keep alcohol in the house. What should they do? Get rid of it? 90% of it? All of it? Are you serious? You got to get rid of all of it? Why? What's the principle here? Why do you have to get rid of all of the alcohol in the alcoholic's life if they want to overcome it? Why? Because they're going to go through a withdrawal. And when that withdrawal starts to come, they know what the solution to it is to fix that terrible, yucky feeling. And what's the solution in their thinking? To drink more, right? So for the alcoholic, it's not wise to keep the alcohol in the house because when they are weak, and indeed they will be at some point, it's in within arm's reach. They grab it when they're weak and they drink and they lose the battle, right? But yet, if they cast it out, not just like take the bottle and carefully set it in the garbage can just in case I want it later, but no, they dump it all out, and then they rinse it out so you can't even lick the bottle, right? And you throw it away, you smash the bottle in your garbage can, and then when that temptation comes to drink, guess what they've created around themselves? A bubble. Amen? You're right, a buffer zone. And so what, what God wants to do is set up a very real hedge of protection around us. And so we ask God to protect us from the things of this world. We ask God to protect us from the invasion of the devil. We say, Lord, please keep the devil away. And then he sets up this hedge of protection. And then we say, hey, guys, what Hollywood movie that you want, do you want to watch with all the rated R information in it? And then the hedge goes bye-bye and the devil comes in. Wow. Is that how it works? That's how it works. The holy angels are here going, get back, you hounds of hell. No, stay back. These are God's people. They've asked for protection. We're protecting them. Out. And the angels are like, don't worry about it. We got Netflix coming in the mail. Don't worry about it. We got this thing coming. Don't worry about it. They're going to surf on the internet. We're going to pop up a little ad. You get the idea, right? All of a sudden, these little arrogant fallen angels who want to do us harm are invited into our presence because we've uh, accepted the things of the devil into our home and the holy angels of God fold their wings and step back and take their light with them. Have mercy is right. No media for 45 days. So what we do is we kick potentially the devil to the curb, if you will, for 45 days. Now, why would we do this? Why would we actually fast from all of it? Well, this is a good question. Because we found scientifically it takes about 45 days to create a new habit. About 40. It will reset our taste buds and our earbuds, if you will. Our discernment will improve. We will begin to hear the voice of God. Our Christian experience will reach new heights. The world will grow strangely dim, praise God, and we will have time to invest in our walk with God, and we will even learn to embrace quiet. I used to not be able to have any quiet in my life. I had to have something going in the background, the radio or the TV or something making some noise because, frankly, I didn't want to be alone with my own thoughts. But as I've spent more time with God and he's helped me deal with so many of these evil thoughts and this broken heart, I have now finally come to the place in my life where I just like quiet. Do you know how freeing that is? Oh, and I even like going into that alpha pattern and relaxing in God's nature or listening to the birds in the trees. Before, I would have thought, <laughs> forget that. So the 90-day challenge, we stop feeding the carnal dog. We starve the carnal dog for 45 days. On day one, we delete all of the media out of our lives or whatever it might be that the Holy Spirit has revealed to be a problem in our life. And then we, we leave the items that we're not quite sure about right now, the gray area. We just leave them and set them aside. We replace the empty time now, and trust me, there will be a lot of time you'll be shocked. 
how much time you have in your life. We, we replace that empty time with productive things. People say, oh, I, I just, I could never do that. Then God's a liar. Because he says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? So that means I can even live without my Facebook. I can't live without it. Then how has humanity done it for the previous 6,000 years? It's amazing to me what we think we need to survive. How will we communicate? Oh, I don't know. Maybe drive over to someone's house and have dinner with them. I don't know. Pick up a telephone and say, Hi, Mom. I love you. Not, Hey, I'm here now. You can't even put complete sentences together. It's all only consonants. No, just... Let's pick up the phone and talk, amen? <laughs> what the devil's doing is he's, he's, he's cutting communication, vital, healthy communication, everywhere he can. I could never do that. I, I don't think I could. I, forget that. If that's your reaction to this challenge, that's to serve as a warning that our souls are distracted from Jesus. Did you catch that? That should serve as a warning. Well, eh, eh, eh. If you immediately like, I'm not going to do that for 45 days, then that means something else has taken up residence in your heart and it's distracting you from Jesus. That's what that means. Now, here are the exceptions. If you are a student and you need your computer or internet access to do your schoolwork, that's fine. If you are at work and your work requires that you email and that you go on the internet or you have to watch a training video or whatever it may be, that's fine. That's not what we're talking about. That would not be practical. We can't just take, you know, 45 days off of life. We have to earn our incomes. I understand. Or we have to go to school. I understand that. If you're doing church, uh, music in church and you need to rehearse, that's great. If you're in music lessons, that's great. If you are in hard rock and roll, learning how to play the I would say no for 45 days. Let God change your taste buds, amen? So the point is that we avoid the junk. We avoid the sinful diet for the, spiritual, for the carnal dog. Now, you will not be able to escape this kind of music or the type of media in this world. We obviously have to go to stores and we have to go to places to make our purchases and we have to fly in airports and we're going to hear these things. So the point is we do our best in our personal lives, right? Because we need to change our dependence on these things. What we do now is we run to music or we run to a movie to escape or run to a TV program just to uh, veg out, instead of going to God in prayer and saying, Lord, I need some help. These things have become distractions in our lives. On day 46, we bring back only the music that we know passes the test. We, of course, had begun on day one reading our Bible, and I'm going to suggest you read The Desire of Ages. You want to know why? This is an entire 90-day program. There are 89 chapters in the Desire of Ages. 89 or 87? Almost 90. And each day, read a chapter and spend time in the Word of God. Find some thought process, some train of study that you always wanted to try to figure out and start. But I don't know how. Now, therefore, go, and I'll be with your brain and teach you how to study the Word of God. Amen? And we ask God to guide us as we analyze the music that we are not sure of. So, in day 46, we bring in the music that we weren't sure of before. You will be astonished at how intelligent you are when you listen to those samples now. Wow. Why? Because God changed our taste buds and our earbuds. Now, some of that music that was questionable, you're going to go, oh, that was fine. And some you're going to go, no way. I didn't perceive that before. 
Each new week following, add one more media source, going through the same process of asking God to awaken your spiritual discernment. And after the 90 days, you will be absolutely amazed at just how close you have drawn to the Lord. In other words, your connection has grown stronger. Amen. And that's the problem that most of us have is the connection with the Lord. We let all these things come in and distract us. So this is a media fast, a 90-day challenge. I have had elders, I've had pastors, I've had young people, school presidents, old people, doesn't matter, principals. I've had probably hundreds and hundreds, I don't know if it's in the thousands yet, take this challenge and their life has been radically changed. I got a letter recently from a, a deaconess, and her husband was the head elder in the church, and she says, I just wanted, I should have brought the letter. She, she says, I just wanted to thank you. I just wanted to, to praise God for what he's done in my husband's life. When you offered that 90-day challenge, he decided to take it. And I have a new husband, and he was a good husband before. But she was saying, he, he just dropped it all, and then he came back to it like you said, and all of a sudden he's like, whoa, and he, he had this huge jazz collection, and he got rid of this jazz collection because he knew what it was pulling him to. He is now on fire. He thought he was on fire before, and so did his wife. He is on fire for God. Why? Because he disconnected from the devil, and he connected to God 100%. It's not rocket science. It's simple but it's not always easy. With the Holy Spirit leading after the 90 days, determine if you should embrace another 90 days. I fought a good fight. This is biblical. Fighting is biblical, by the way. I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Friends, I'm going to tell you right now, I have also testimonies from people to where they say, we decided to take your challenge. And that very same day when they went home, they said, by the evening's end, we were already climbing the walls. They, they said, we did not realize just how addicted we were to this secular society. And we thought we were the church. Some of you in this room are severely addicted. And it's only going to be through major prayer time with God that you're going to get through it. But guess what? You can get through it. You can. And your life can be changed forever when you're no longer distracted. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Why? Because we fought the good fight of faith, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. This was our opening text, and guess what? The four C's are in one text. Let's go over it. And they, who's that? The church. And the church overcame him, the devil. What C is overcame? Conquered, that's right. And the church conquered the devil by the blood of the Lamb. Their connection to Christ. And by the word of their testimony, they commenced the work of God. They went out and started to tell the people of this planet of what their Lord had done for them. And they loved not their lives unto the death because they were fully committed. Amen? And the church conquered the devil by their connection with the Lamb and by the commencement of giving their testimony. And they were fully committed even unto the death. But friends, without the connection, there is no victory. So I want to encourage you to be very confident of this very thing. 
that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. He's promised, I believe it, and you can take that all the way to heaven. Don't you let the devil distract you anymore. How many of you are even considering taking the 90-day challenge? Wow, really? Praise the Lord. That is impressive. I can make you one promise. It will change your life. It'll change it. You will be in 90 short days a, connect, a more connected Christian. And like our family, you may have to do another 90 days. Maybe another 90 days. <laughs> but what's that in the blip of time it is that just a blip and I want to encourage each one of you to embrace that challenge to say yes I want to connect to God and God alone forget the devil I'm casting him out and friends when you do that your life will be changed forever. I promise. In fact, forget what I promise. God promises. Amen? Being confident of this very thing, that He which hath begun a good work in you, notice who does the work, Jesus Christ. He that hath begun a good work in you, He will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. We only but need to let him do it.